All right, while they're setting up, I'm going to spend, because I have 18 pages of accolades here to talk about this gentleman. Um, this is a special uh, keynote for me because this is my old advisor from uh, my master's program. Let me read some stuff. Um, it's, a, it's a laundry list, and uh, it really speaks to his uh, performance over the last two decades. Uh, Dr. Sturgio, he comes from Thessaloniki, Greece. Uh, he has numerous current positions. Chair of the Department of Biomechanics at UNO, University of Nebraska, Omaha, where he's also a Distinguished Community Research Chair and Professor, Director for the Center for Research in Human Movement Variability, the Dean of the Division of Biomechanics and Research Development at UNO. <coughs> he's also a uh, professor at the College of Public Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Let's see, he did his bachelor's in Thessaloniki at Aristotle University, his master's at UNO, doctorate at the University of Oregon under the esteemed Barry Bates, a very well-known biomechanist. After that, he moved back to Greece to, uh, as all Greeks must do, is participate in the military. So, kudos to that. Uh, then he moved back to the States and he became an assistant professor at UNO at about the time that I met him. So in very humble beginnings, UNO is a teaching institution, not a research institution. So what he's been able to do in the past two, uh, two decades is pretty astounding in that respect. He started in a 900 square foot laboratory. Um, he's in the time of those two decades, he has created the Department of Biomechanics, the Center for the Research of, uh, in Human Movement Variability, both first of their kind in the world, no others exist. He has developed PhD programs at the Medical Center and uh, at the uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, the people at Lincoln, they think they're the big brothers, but he puts them in their place. He's like the little brother that is six foot five that kicks the little brother's butt. And that doesn't make UNMC nor Lincoln very happy. Um, he's, uh, let's see, graduated the first students from the biomedical engineering PhD program. Uh, he's led the development uh, approval of the doctoral program in exercise science at UNO back in 2012. Led the development of the Bachelor of Science program in biomechanics, only the third program in the country, or probably in the world, perhaps. Um, the first UNO faculty to ever obtain private funding to construct an entire new building for his discipline and one of the few in the world. So he's transformed from 900 square feet laboratory into a 23,000 square foot building. He secured, to create that building, he secured a $6 million private donation. It currently houses over 70 faculty, staff, and students. When I was with him, it was him, myself, and my best friend Shane <laughs> in 900 square feet with archaic equipment. Nick's uh, Biomechanics Research Building is the world's first building dedicated to biomechanics research and solely to the study of how the human body moves. And if I remember right, you're building a new building that'll be ready next year that's 31,000 square feet. So the state just keeps throwing money at him because he produces. And so in this, uh, our conference uh, theme of uh, where we're really wanting to get people to disseminate information, he is a definite example for that. He's mentored hundreds of undergraduates, graduates, doctoral candidates, postdoctoral fellows. He has 14 inventions in biomechanics. Uh, he's authored a few books and more to come, Innovative Analysis of Human Movement and Nonlinear Analysis of Human Movement Variability, and has published over 200 peer-reviewed articles. He is the international authority on nonlinear dynamics in biomechanics, spoken all over the world, anywhere from Norway to Japan, Greece, France, and he's always traveling. I can never get in touch with him. Uh, he's in the National Academy of Kinesiology. Uh, he's received so many awards at UNO that I did not even begin to want to list them, but I think every one that he's available for to receive, he has won them. He reviews grants for many national uh, organizations, including NIH. Uh, he has more than $30 million in grants from NIH, NASA, NSF, and other agencies. His most notable award is a P-20 grant for $10 million from the NIH.
Thank you. So it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you for uh, this uh, very kind introduction. And as uh, Jeremy said, like, um, really, when I started my career early, um, in 1996, actually, it was just, uh, just myself, uh, him, and one more individual, uh, St. Scolton, who actually is also uh, a faculty in a small university in, um, in South Dakota. Um, but um, I think is, uh, is the hard work and the ingenuity of these two uh, individuals from the Midwest who practically just started all this. Uh, we got some amazing people here in the Midwest with uh, uh, characteristics that they're truly superb, uh, gentle, hardworking, smart, and um, I, I, I've been the beneficiary of that as well, too. So anyway, um, uh, this is the title that was given to me by the, by the combined uh, education uh, credit hours. I need to make some disclosures. That's also like a slide that, <laughs> that um, was, uh, I had to do. And also, these are the objectives for any of the people who are taking credit hours here, OK? All right, so uh, putting this out of the way, OK, let's go ahead and get started. OK, so. Um, First of all, I want to thank you all for coming here, actually, on a Saturday. Uh, so um, I, 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 value, I value my time over the weekends, so it's, uh, it's really nice to see so many people here on, uh, on, uh, on a weekend. And I want to thank very much, actually, like Brian and Jeremy, uh, who uh, invited me here, and, and Zane as well, too, who was uh, also our student, like, recently. So anyway, what I want to talk to you about is, like, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I do for research, okay? And um, uh, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to, what I'm going to do first is like I'm going to present you first of all our theoretical background, and then I'm going to move into some examples. Okay. Um, and um, first of all, before I get started, is I, I want to present to you is like just in the general terms, what is that I'm interested in? Okay. Uh, so since my graduate years, actually my graduate education years, I, I became fascinated with variability. Okay. Now, what do we mean by that, okay? So let's say, for example, like today, uh, you know, you finish your day, hopefully sooner than later, and you decide to go out for a cold one, okay? Um, so you have a beer, and while you're drinking beer, you decide to play a game of darts, okay? Now, while you're playing darts, you try to hit bullseye, okay? But you will not gonna be able to hit always bullseye. If you will, please let me know, and I will be your manager, okay? <laughs> and we'll make really good money together, okay? All right? But you're not gonna be able to do so, okay? Well, that's variability, okay? But the, the funny thing is like, you might be saying like, okay, well, playing darts is not like something that I do actually on a daily basis. I'm not that good at it, okay? Well, guess what? In watching every single one of you, is LeBron James, okay? Every single one of you, okay, in watching. You practice watching so much over the years that you are absolutely exceptional, okay? All right? You're Le the LeBron James of watching, okay? But guess what? You still cannot put all the free throws through, okay? What I mean by that, okay? Every step that you make is different from the previous one, okay? <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, so there is again variability even there. It's something that a Russian actually biomechanists uh, called repetition without repetition. Okay, so I was extremely fascinated with this variability, and there is a lot of questions that we can ask with respect to this. Okay, now the question is, all right, since there are very, it's a very interesting question, and, and probably as you will see, there is like all kind of like very very. Uh, interesting uh, questions that we can ask with respect to that as well too. The, the very first thing that we have to consider is like how we're going to go about studying variability, okay? Well, I bet if we will go around and ask like this exceptional students that we have in, in this university, um, we, they will probably say like, well, Dr. Sergio, you know something? I know the answer to that. You do? Fantastic, okay? Uh, I learned about these things called the standard deviation, okay, and, and variance and range and stuff like that. Okay, I'm going to use those. Well, what I'm going to tell you that I'm going to tell you that this is not exactly the right way of doing things. Okay, all right, and I'm going to explain to you why is that the case. All right, 
First of all, these traditional linear measures, let's call them linear measures, standard deviation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they come with some problems. <laughs> the fine print, okay, it's kind of like this credit card that it comes to you and says to you like, okay, sign up for credit card, but if you do, in, with little, little teeny dingy letters, it just says, we're gonna get you, okay? <laughs> All right? <laughs> well, it's the same thing that goes on with these things. Why? Because they make some assumptions. What are the assumptions? One of them is that observations has to be independent of each other. Well, guess what? If you will play darts and you will hold to the right, wouldn't your next shot will be to the left of the target? Ha ha. You just violated independence if you will just take all these observations and put them all together. Your shots, by the way, okay? The other problem that we have is that there is another assumption, the assumption of randomness. Observations, they have to be random, pretty similar to the first one, okay? Again, for the reason that I just said, you're violating that as well, too. If your very first step is on ice, you know, it will dictate your following steps, okay? And you will probably walk much, much more careful way, okay? So they are not independent, they are not are random, these observations. The other interesting thing is that these traditional tools, they give different answers for some other tools that I'm gonna call them nonlinear measures, okay? Uh, practically, what I mean by that, this, uh, this linear measures, they pretty much tell you, gives you an indication about variability around a central point, okay? All right, around the central point. So they tell you how much movement or how much variability we got around the central point, okay? All right, so this is an amount or magnitude type of an answer. But they don't tell you anything about the pattern, okay? How were you hitting, okay? You're, you're throwing your darts, how? Did you have like many to the right, many to the left? Did, was there a pattern, okay, when you were actually throwing? They didn't tell you anything about what is going on over time, okay? And uh, let me give you an example of that, okay? I always like to have like this graphical examples so you can understand what I'm talking about. So this is two data sets, okay? They have the same mean and the same standard deviation, okay? All right, so someone might say, well, you know, Nick, there is no differences here. Yeah, absolutely, okay? Well, what about if I'll tell you that the first data set came from this distribution and the second data set came from this distribution? How about them apples, okay, all right, all right? Houston, we have a problem. We got a problem. What about if this is a healthy person and this is an unhealthy person and you just made a conclusion that they are both healthy? How about that, okay? All right, so, so you see, you see that's, that's a serious situation, which is right in the heart of what? Of pretty much everything that we are doing. Okay, pretty much everything that we are doing. So we need like actually some other tools in order for us to be able to evaluate the variability with respect to its organization, with respect to how things change in time. So uh, we need tools like entropy or dimension, correlation dimension or Lyapunov exponent and several other tools that I've been using through my career. This again is three actually, uh, uh, three actually, um, signals and they have the same range, they're plotted with the same range and believe me actually, uh, I, they pretty much have the same in the same standard deviation as well too. But now with entropy or correlation dimension, I get different answers and I can actually utilize those things actually to make conclusions. All right, now, however, let's see what people thought before about variability. It's just like, Nick, you just discovered it? No, I did not discover variability, I did not discover America, okay, all right. Um, there were people who they were interested about that in the past. But in the past, mostly people thought that variability is noise in the system, okay? That's what they thought it is. It's noise in the system. It's kind of like this noise that you practically get on your radio when you were trying to, when you drive to work and you're trying to listen to, I don't know, Christina Aguilera or something, okay? And you got like some static noise on top of it and you just mess around with the dial to get rid of it, okay? People thought that it is actually noise in the system. So what we need to do is like, we just need to get rid of it. Give me a pill, doc. I want to get rid of my variability. I want to always hit bullseye, okay? All right, now, that didn't make a lot of sense to me, okay? So what I did is I was able to put variability or movement under the microscope. Really, <laughs> okay? Yes, under the microscope. The same way that you take blood, 
okay? And you put blood right in front of you, and you cannot tell what's going on in there, if there are viruses or anything, other, anything else, if you don't put a microscope there, okay? The same thing holds true with movement, okay? The same thing holds true with movement. With our eye, we can only see 12 pictures per second, okay? Aristotle, my great-great-grandfather, okay, all right, thought actually when horses run, okay, they always have one foot on the ground. He wrote a book about it <laughs> as well, too. Okay, all right. They solved that actually, uh, that actually uh, problem, I guess, or that uh, in, they, they found that this was incorrect actually by using biomechanics early in the previous century. So, in the only way to be able to tell what is going on in terms of variability from one step to the next to the next to the next is like you got to put it under the microscope. So, our microscope is high speed cameras. <laughs> That's our microscope, high speed cameras. Force platforms who they can collect data in a hundred or thousand actually like frames per second okay, or pictures per second as well too. And now we have those things available. And not only we have those things available, now we have the computers and the capabilities to store those data, analyze them, okay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When I was a graduate student, actually just to analyze 10 trials, 10, just, just 10 footfalls. It was a pain, okay, we needed days, okay. Now we can analyze like thousands of steps actually, okay, in a matter of minutes <laughs> sometimes, okay. So now we actually have the tools to be able to study these things, okay. And not only we have the tools to study these things, we actually can put actually watching, let's say, under like all kind of like different situations. Here, for example, is a person watching in our virtual reality environment. Now, if you do that, both our, labo our laboratory and several others, we have discovered that actually when we are looking at variability over time, we see some very interesting patterns, okay? So what we see, actually, we see interesting distributions. So for example, we see that actually we don't have really a normal distribution, but what we have is like we have many actually uh, uh, small size movements many medium-sized movements, a few big movements in terms of steps, for example, okay? Uh, also, we have uh, something which is called self-similarity. So when I'm looking actually a bunch of steps, or uh, here is like stride interval, if I'm looking like a bunch of steps, if I will take a smaller piece of it and blow it up, it has the same actually statistical properties as the bigger piece, okay? Uh, it's a similar with what we see, for example, in the Sierpinski Triangle. If I'll take a smaller piece and blow it up, it's very, very similar with a bigger piece, and this, uh, it keeps going and going and going. So we see that actually with variability of movement as well, too. But guess what? We see the same type of distributions in nature, okay? Pretty soon, okay, our trees will look like that, <laughs> okay, all right? Well, this distribution is the same thing, one big branch, uh, uh, about like yay, uh, medium sized branches and a lot of small, small, small branches. But guess what? We see the same inside of us as well too, okay? All right, we see the same in our lungs, we see the same, for example, in our cardiovascular system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then why should the movement should be different, okay? Isn't that make sense? Why should movement should be different? Why variability should be different, okay? At least in my mind, makes absolutely sense. Uh, now, here is the funny thing also, too. We like those patterns. We like those type of distributions. We like actually music that has that type of a distribution as well, too. Okay? A fantastic paper in Nature, actually, the 1967 told us that. Uh, we also like, for example, art that has that type of distribution. Okay? Uh, there is also a fantastic paper about Jackson Pollock's uh, paintings where they actually have that type of distributions, okay? et cetera, et cetera. Now, here it's a couple of more interesting things. Pathology can actually affect those patterns when we see that we see in human movement. Okay, so what, how? First of all, sometimes it can actually like eliminate this variability. It can make you a robot. Practically every step that you make is very, very similar with the previous one. I'm a robot. Danger, 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 danger. I'm a robot, okay? Now, if you are robotic, guess what will happen? you don't have any adaptability, you don't have any flexibility, you are very rigid. Now, um, I know that some, many of you, you are clinicians, and you can probably relate to that with some patients that you have, okay? All right, at the same time also, in other situations, you can actually 
for example, in frail older adults, that's my mom actually, okay, you can be very noisy, kind of like all over the place, okay? So if in the bar that I was talking to you, okay, if you will have one too many, you may be a frail older adult, okay? Kind of like all over the place. <laughs> you become very noisy, in other words, okay? All right? So it could go both ways, and you can lose those beautiful patterns that I was mentioning to you, okay? So then what is health? Health is a rich behavioral state, okay? And um, it's complex, but this complexity has these beautiful patterns. It's an organized complexity, practically, okay? This is actually... Uh, reminds a lot uh, a book by Schrodinger. Uh, Schrodinger is the guy with the Schrodinger's cat, you know, Nobel Prize in theoretical physics. Uh, okay, he said in his book, What is Life? Life is an aperiodic crystal. It is not random, but it's also not periodic. It is something in between. So personally, I believe that variability is the spice of life. Okay, that's what I think. All right, now, um, in 2006, we proposed the theoretical model that engulfs this. And we said that there is an optimal level of variability, okay? And this optimal level of variability is associated with health. This variability also has form. When you lose this variability, you can become either rigid, okay, or you can become very, very noisy, okay? Um, so uh, being healthy makes you very, very adaptable, okay? This is something that we see also in nature as well, too. Okay, and uh, in other words, complexity is actually, we define complexity as a highly variable fluctuations in physiological processes uh, who, they are, who they are being guided by these mathematical principles of chaos and fractals that we also see in nature as well too, and these are these beautiful patterns as well. If we put a schematic to that, okay, uh, on the y-axis we have complexity, okay, high complexity, that is health, okay, that is not healthy. Or in, on the x-axis, you have predictability, very predictable, a robot, very unpredictable, a frail older adult, health is in the middle and up, okay? Very, very simple model, okay? Just recently, we revised this model, actually, okay, to include other biorhythms. So more recently, for example, we revised this to say, guess what? It's not only your gait, but it's also your breathing, it's also your blood pressure. All of those are biorhythms as well, too. Even your circadian rhythms, okay? All those are biorhythms, okay? And guess what? You can have one being rigid and another one being what? Being complex, okay? All of them, they have to have a similar complexity. And if one of them is very periodic, all of them will be very periodic. And you will be non-healthy as well, too, okay? So that's exactly what we said here. So our graph before, if actually the interaction between all those biorhythms is complex, then your, your graph has high concavity. If they are all kind of like robotic, then your graph has low concavity. This is less dexterity, this is high dexterity as well too. So that actually combined all the other biorhythms, the variability through your body, through all the biorhythms temporally as well too. Okay? Now, one of the things that I do want to mention to you here, with respect to the young people here, this is my theoretical model, okay? All right? You should, uh, for, especially for the young people in the audience who they are aspiring to be scientists, I want to tell you one thing. If you don't have a theory, you are just like me in the middle of Kirksville with no GPS and nobody to call, okay? I don't know where I'm going, okay? All right? So you got to have a theory, okay? You gotta have a theory. It doesn't have to be yours. You can borrow it from someone else. Now, don't be married with your theory, however, because 99% of theories, they go into the garbage can, okay? All right? And all you do as a scientist is to test your theory, to disprove your theory. That's all you do, okay? All right, so uh, based on all this, we created a whole center, actually, back in Omaha, the Center of Human Move Variability Research, and we do all kind of different projects over there. Right now, for example, the different projects that they are ongoing is one on total knee arthroplasty, another one with stroke, one with diabetes and peripheral arterial disease, and one with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So these are four different ongoing projects over there. Uh, but what I want to talk to you from now on, actually, for the rest time that I got, is like, I want to give you some examples of this theoretical background for my research, okay? The very first one is, I'm gonna use babies <laughs> for the first one. Why babies? They are cute, everybody likes them, okay? <laughs> All right? 
<laughs> I worked for, for years in motor development. So anyway, so, so here we were very interested actually. We're very, oops, we're very interested. We're very interested actually in uh, variability in terms of sitting, okay? Guess what? There is variability even when you stand or when you sit. So for example, when I'm standing, I'm actually swaying. And if you close your eyes, you will sway more. You don't stand absolutely still. The same thing happened when you're sitting, okay? So here is a baby early in life who is trying to sit. Oops, it's difficult. I got this big head. Don't let me go, okay? <laughs> I mean, really, the baby has a center of gravity which is up here, okay, with this big head, okay? They look cute, but they got a big head, okay? All right, so they fall, okay? Well, guess what? In a few months, they're gonna look very, very nice. Look at this, ah, very nice, okay? Very nice, sitting still and stuff like that, okay? All right, so we're very, very interested about how this is happening, and the reason we're very interested about that because this is the very first motor milestone which is essential for development. Because before you will sit upright, what you see is this. Uh, that's not that exciting, okay? But if I will do this, oh, I see you, how are you doing, okay? That's exciting, I can see people watching, I can see what people are doing, okay? So this is a very, very important motor milestone. Guess what? For infants who they have cerebral palsy or other problems, uh, developmental delays, they have a hard time developing this. And not only that, delays in terms of, for example, this motor milestone leads to further delays in terms of standing, watching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And for any of you that you've ever worked with kids that they had cerebral palsy, you know that they will undergo 10 or 20 or 30 surgeries just to be able to walk close to normal, okay, all right? So our idea was if we will study variability early in life, then maybe then what we can do we can actually develop an intervention for these kids, okay, so they can develop actually the upright sitting position in a much, much faster fashion, okay? All right, so, so that's exactly what we start doing. We look at variability of sway, okay? And we look at both linear measures, amount of movement. We look at nonlinear measures, temporal structure, okay, or how variability is organized in time. We looked at that. Uh, by the way, everything is published, and I gave my presentation, okay? All right, so, uh, so this is what we did, okay? Step number one. Our first step was to find out if these things are reliable. So the very first thing that we did, we looked at intra and intercession reliability, okay? So we looked at both typically developing infants and infants who they were, either they had CP or they were at risk of CP. And we found out that actually both the linear and nonlinear measures, they had a high ICC values, or in other words, uh, the evaluation of the center of pressure, that sway thing uh, in the base of support is actually a reliable method to look at sitting. Okay, and clinicians could actually use those measures actually to explore sitting, okay? So we established the reliability. Step number two, do we actually need them <laughs> now, <laughs> okay? I mean, in other words, do they actually provide me with complementary information or they just give me the same, same type of answers, okay? So that was a very, very important thing, to see if we actually need them, okay? Uh, and we actually found out that we do need them, okay? First of all, uh, when one goes up, the other one goes down. When linear measures went up, the other one went down. But that is not the most critical thing. The most critical thing was that we're providing me different answers with respect to what's going on in the AP direction and the mediolateral direction in terms of sitting, okay? So, and our principal component analysis shows that they were loading on different factors as well, too. So that means what? Yes, we do need them, okay? We need them both, okay? We're speculating that will be the case, but that was proven as well, too. Now, can also these measures discriminate between typically developing infants and infants with developmental delay, okay? That was the third step, okay? All right, you see how we go from one step to the next, to the next, to the next, for the young people, or continuing education credit hours, that's science. This is called science, <laughs> okay? <laughs> anyway, all right. All right, okay, so can they measure, <laughs> can, they, can they discriminate between typically developing infants and infants with developmental delays, okay? All right, so uh, the answer was yes. And not only, uh, not only actually they could discriminate, but sometimes 
they could actually provide more detailed information even uh, and, and perform superiorly even from standard clinical tests like the gross motor function measure, okay? Um, and as I said, like they provide significant differences. And that was not only the case with sitting, but also was the case with walking, and also was the same with the supine position of babies who they have them actually like lay on a mat with sensors as well too. Those experiments were performing, this were performed in Michigan and this were performed in Virginia Commonwealth. All right, now, now that we know all this, okay, remember our goal was actually to see if maybe we can develop some type of like a therapy. So remember the model says what? It gives you an indication of what is healthy and what is non-healthy. Can we translate that to a therapy? And that's what we did with our physical therapist there. So we said like, okay, so when do we have uh, this situation, this situation where you are kind of like a frail older adult, complete randomness, okay? Well, you have this when a child, for example, in sitting will behave like, for example, with constant pushing and pulling, like almost something like that, okay? All right? Uh, when do we have actually rigidity? We see rigidity when you have, like, for example, uh, tremendous hypotonia, okay? All right? When you see something like that, very static position, very hypotonic, okay? So what we did then, we tried to come up with possible interventions, okay, that will actually try to get the kids out of this situation. So, for example, with constant pushing and pulling with extreme ranges, we provided, like, soft constraints, soft boundaries. When we had, for example, this static rigid situation, we wanted to provide like a slight active movement with a changing the environment, for example, to get the baby out of that situation, okay? All right, and the same thing actually with overall reduced complexity, kind of like yay, when we see like very little active movement, we wanted to provide more sensory information and enhance active movement. Active movement is, you know, have the child actually to move, regardless if they are failing or not, okay? Well, passive movement will be, I'm moving the child, okay, all right? So we designed, actually, this therapy, okay? And then uh, we put it on, into a test. <laughs> we got the money to do a clinical trial, okay? So uh, let's see this child. Um, let's just see some videos of that. This is before therapy. This is a child that has CP. And uh, you see how difficult it is for this child to sit. It actually has breathing problems as well, too. It's a very, very hard time to sit. This is actually post-therapy. That's pretty really awesome, huh? So that's why I sleep well at night. I don't know how you sleep, but I sleep very well. Because of this thing. Okay. That's why I love my job. Okay. Now, of course, you might be saying, Nick, you picked up the good videos. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's just look at some data. Let's look at some data as well, too. Okay. So this is, as I said, we did a clinical trial of that. For that, this is pre-post interventions. We had like three arms. Um, one was typically developing babies, but they were all started from the same um, uh, behavioral point. So, in other words, we didn't look at age. We look at behaviorally if they were at the same point, so in terms of their sitting capabilities, okay? That's why you see all arms very, very close with each other right here, okay? Then we look at, uh, we took actually a uh, couple of months of the complexity therapy. We look at a couple of months of a home program. That home program was the standard care of treatment at that time, okay? Was mostly based actually on passive movements, at least in Nebraska. Um, and then actually was typically development, and this is actually babies who they didn't have any problems, okay? So the babies who they're either at risk or they had CP, they went into these two arms, okay? So let's look at what happened, okay? So typically developing babies during the same type of amount of time they have for this specific variable an upward trend. The complexity therapy produced a similar upward trend. The home program produces a downward trend. So someone might say that actually the home program or the standard care of treatment is not actually helping. It's actually doing probably the opposite of helping. Okay, all right? So while the complexity therapy is helping as well too. Okay, all right. Now we see the same patterns with several other variables as well too. Okay? Uh, the interesting thing is like we repeated this clinical trial as well too. Okay, and we found the same things. 
Okay? So this specific actually therapy, um, I, I call it complexity therapy here, but we call it motor perceptual therapy. That specific therapy actually, now actually, as far as I know, it has been adopted by several states as the standard care of treatment. One of them is the state of Arizona, actually. All right, okay, so, but enough with about babies, okay? Now let's look at something else as well, too, okay? All right, so um, let's look at falls in the elderly, okay, which is another topic which Oh, it's also very, very important to me since my mom actually fell several times. So since actually she started falling, I became very interested into that and I, I dedicated practically the last almost 10 years of my career on this, okay? Now, um, we know that falls is a big problem, okay? We know also from the previous research that has been done that amount of variability, okay, is larger in fallers as compared to non-fallers. We, know, we also know that amount of gait variability, okay, can also uh, uh, predict people who they are susceptible to faults as well, too. Uh, we also know that uh, amount of gait variability is also an indicator of impairment, okay? But what we don't know is the mechanism behind of these things, okay? So, uh, so this is like some of the studies that we did in this area, okay? Uh, so first of all, we did several studies in this, okay? Uh, the very, very, the very first study, actually, I think Jeremy actually collected the data right here, okay? All right, so long, long time ago, because we, we had an interest into that, actually, from long, long time ago. So anyway, we found, actually, that older adults, with respect to nonlinear measures, but also linear measures, okay, they always have higher values, okay? They always have higher values. Not only amount of gate variability, but also they have higher values in terms of these nonlinear measures that I was talking to you, okay? Now, walking slower does not eliminate those, okay? All right? Now, this is also the case. We see this with similar type of uh, populations who they also suffer with, by a lot of falls, like, let's say, Parkinson patients, okay? So here, for example, we see, like, some bars where they just, this is Parkinson, this is older adults, this is young, healthy. So you see an upward trend, okay, in these situations. So this is a healthy young, this is a healthy older, this is a Parkinson patient. And this is actually gait cycles, cycles of walking, okay, flexing and extending your knee. And you see how actually the patterns get actually more diverse and eventually they get even more diverse, okay, all right? So that practically tells me that they're getting much, much more variable. Okay, but this doesn't happen only for amount of variability, but also happens for this nonlinear measures that I was talking to you about. Here it's another interesting thing that we're also able to find. We did some modeling, and we found out that if you take a model and you make it very noisy, if you go and push it, it's going to fall much, much easier as well, too. Okay, all right. So with all this, we found that, yes, this is a serious problem. People will fall. And this not, doesn't happen only for variability for amount, but also happen for the organization variability, okay? So how can we attack these problems, okay? Well, so um, one of the very first experiments we did in this area is like we're looking if sensory manipulations can affect gait variability, actually, okay? But we're not looking at elderly at that time. This was a very serendipitous result, okay? And many, many times when you work hard in science, serendipity hits your door, okay? See Marie Curie, okay? All right, so, so this is my Marie Curie moment, I guess, okay? All right, so we had people walk with a weight on one side, okay? So when you put a weight on one side, you get a limp. Okay, correct, all right, okay? All right, so this is some data to support this, <laughs> okay? This is one leg, this is the other leg. This is time that you spend on the ground with each leg, so you see, you're limping, okay? Yeah. Well, if I will have you exposed to virtual reality, if you walk in virtual reality, this is ha what happens. Wow. Wow. Okay, you just overrode the weight. Okay? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Okay? All right? I mean, that, this is really amazing. Okay? I, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. Okay? Really? We are not limping anymore, <laughs> okay? Actually, what happens is you try to walk much, much more symmetrically. You overrode that proprioceptive information with your visual information, okay? So uh, here is another experiment we did just, just to make sure that things are happening in that fashion. So we had people walk, again, with and without VR, 
but on an on a even more difficult situation, we had them walk on a treadmill that was dual belt, okay? So one belt will be going like slower than the other belt, okay? All right, so we gave them a limp from the treadmill, okay? Even more difficult. Let's look at the data. This is without VR. This is with VR. You see how much closer they got as well to you? Okay, amazing. So at that time, we said like, okay, variability could be affected by sensory manipulations, okay? But the question is, what sensory manipulations? What sensory manipulations? We weren't sure about that, okay? So we were exploring different types of sensory manipulations. We even look at dual tasking, for example. Here is some results from dual tasking. So we had actually people perform a secondary task while watching, okay? So what they had to do is like, this is dichotic listening. They were listening from one side, the other side, or both sides, and they had to say out loud what they were listening, okay? All right, so let's see what happens. Young, in all these conditions, didn't care, the black columns, okay? The elderly, actually, they dropped their variability, both for the nonlinear measures, but also for the linear measures. Aha! A secondary task, actually, is probably not detrimental. Okay? It can help you. And if it could be combined with the sensory manipulation, maybe then you are into something. Okay? All right, so we tried like all kind of different sensory manipulations <laughs> over the years, actually, to just find out what is probably the best. One of those that we tried, now, I have to say this, I mean, I'm not the smartest kid on the block, okay? There is like a lot of smarter, smarter kid out there. So a lot of people are doing some of these things, okay? So this is actually, so some people actually up in Boston, okay, in Harvard, they did something similar. So they built a, a little actually like uh, insole that they had actually all folks stand on them, okay? And those were vibrating, subthreshold vibration. Look at what happened to their sway, their, their sway variability. It decreased a lot, okay? All right, so someone might say that this is a great intervention, okay? However, there is no retention. As soon as you take that thing off and, and you walk away, it doesn't work, okay? Now, we, did, we tried to do the same with babies as well, too, okay? We didn't do it with adults at that time. Eventually, we did it all with adults, but we did it with babies initially, okay? We were so inspired by this, by saying, like, well, let's try this as well, too. Sensory manipulations to improve their sitting. So what we did is, like, we, we built a vibrating device, and we had the babies sit on this vibrating device, okay? We vibrated their bottoms. Ah, how much fun, huh? Okay, all right. Um, and we did a clinical trial for that, okay? All right. No effect. No effect after a clinical trial, okay? Uh, this, is, this is before the intervention and after the intervention, two arms. Uh, vibration and no vibration. It's actually no significance, okay? So we saw actually that vibration actually, it did not work, okay? But the interesting thing is like, why did not work? We believe that it did not work because when you vibrate someone, all it depends, all the sensory manipulation depends upon the signal that you're providing. Those actually manipulations, the vibration is stochastic. So what you're doing, you're feeding into the system white noise. You're feeding into the system this randomness. You're actually telling the system, be what? Like a frail older adult. I don't want that. What I want, I want these complex patterns. I want these beautiful patterns that I was telling you about. This is what I prefer. So the question is, can you vibrate me <laughs> with these patterns? Can you feed into me? through sensory input to those patterns? You bet you, <laughs> okay? Um, and I'll tell you how we did that. But before I will tell you how we did that, let's look at one more experiment, actually, that other people try to do, okay? To decrease variability, also in Parkinson patients, they, people use metronomes as well, too, okay? They use both visual metronomes and audio metronomes, okay? So this is a visual metronome. You have people walk on parallel lines, on the tilted lines. They have them actually step on tilted transverse lines, okay? All right, so let's look what happened. Parkinson patients, parallel lines, transverse lines. Variability goes, uh, cadence goes way down, variability disappears. Healthy controls, same thing, okay? Parallel lines, transverse lines, same thing. Exactly identical with the, healthy, with the Parkinson patients. But guess what? You made them all robots, okay? You, you just make them all robots. That's not what you want. You don't want to be a robot, remember that? Okay, you don't want to be a robot, okay? And um, 
And of course, this will have no long-term effects, okay? Again, this is not something that you desire. You want these complex patterns, as I was mentioning to you, okay? All right, so the question is, how can I feed into the system these complex patterns? Okay, so we did that initially with an auditory signal. So what do I mean by that? So I can take like this, which is math practically, which is existing nature, and translate it into music, <laughs> or I can take real music and make it variable. So what we did is like, we, did, we took actually like people's cadence, okay, we measured their cadence, and then what we did, we had them step on notes, okay, but the notes were coming to them in a variable fashion, okay. Now let's see if this will play. Yeah, can you hear that? All right. This is pure release. <laughs> okay. Metronome. The time is always the same. The time between the notes, always the same. So this is a fast walk. Imagine that you have to walk on that, very fast. Okay, all right. This is the patterns you like, and they are in nature. This is stochastic noise all over the place. All embedded in few release, okay? So you have people walk on that, okay? The results. Let's look at the results. Here's the results of this, okay? All right. This is the model, I want to remind you, okay? This is the data, okay? This is auditory. This is young adults, first of all. No stimulus, they're healthy. Um, this is older adults, this is the no stimulus. They are below actually those patterns, but they're about 0.8, okay? This is a complexity measure, okay? The, the pink is actually, I, we use the pink, okay? The pink is actually this nature-based metronomes, okay? Look at the older adults, they're actually getting higher, okay, in terms of complexity. Look at the young adults, they also get higher values, very, very close to what they had before because they're healthy. Both the metronome and the uh, random as well too, they give you like much, much lower values in terms of complexity, kind of like replicating this model, okay? Now, uh, uh, I, wanna, I wanna tell you something about that too. Of course, someone might say, well, Nick, do we have retention on that? Do, can they retain those patterns? Because that's the most important thing, okay? We have, we have found that we have about 10, 15 minutes of retention for a fact, okay? But please pray so we can get our grants approved by the NIH so we can do the long-term intention <laughs> and this as an intervention. But we are right there, okay? Now, I wanna tell you something also which is pretty cool. We did the same experiment, but not with watching, but we did it with tapping, with tapping, okay? And at the same time that we were tapping, we're also looking actually brain behavior, okay? To see what's gonna happen with that. We hear actually people tap actually in all kind of different metronomes, okay? And here is the funny thing. You actually see changes in the brain as well too. You see changes in the brain when actually people tap on more complex metronomes. Wow, okay? I guess that's why that got published in Journal of Neuroscience. Okay, all right, now someone might say, auditory, unique, you saw me earlier that virtual reality actually was so powerful. Why not visual, okay, while watching? Oh, absolutely, I'm with you, okay? So this is glasses, okay? This is metronome glasses, okay? So what you have here, you got like a bar that is moves up and down, and you can step on it when the bar is at the lowest point, okay, all right? Uh, so we did this experiment, the same, same results. Look at this, actually. This is older adults, no stimulus, they're very low, okay? With the variable stimulus, the stimulus that is actually you prefer, you go all the way close to where the healthy young are located, okay? The other ones bring you down. Same thing here with, uh, with the young, okay? Uh, we did actually the same experiment now uh, that we did before with auditory, this is with auditory, but actually now over ground, because the previous experiment was actually on the treadmill. When we did it over ground, the results were even more impressive 
This is the visual, this is the auditory. When you look at the auditory with, with the older adults, look at this, okay, very, very high values. Okay, so very, very impressive in terms of this intervention. Okay? Now, we are also doing another experiment. We're vibrating now people with these patterns, not with stochastic now vibrations, but with these patterns as well too. We do this experiment actually with amputees, and we are vibrating actually their stump. We are vibrating, oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I just, not, not everything transferred correctly, okay? We are vibrating their stump actually. So anyway, we're vibrating the stump to see if actually the unit will actually fit better together. We did like all kind of different vibrations. One of them was actually vibrations with, with this variable uh, ways, uh, this complex patterns I was talking to you about. All right, now, unfortunately, we're getting close to the end. I can talk to you for hours about many, many more <laughs> wonderful projects that I've done. We tried to put like in, you know, like, I don't know, maybe in 40, 50 minutes, kind of like a career of 20, 20 30 years. So uh, I can talk to you forever about all kind of like different projects, uh, like the one that we are doing with peripheral arterial disease. Um, just briefly on peripheral arterial disease, just right here in Nebraska, we found out that actually peripheral arterial disease is uh, the way that they were treating people in terms of peripheral arterial disease was incorrect, okay? Why? Because they were giving people practically either drugs to get more blood there, okay, blood thinners or vasodilators actually, to get more blood actually in the lower extremities. Um, or they will do grafts actually to bypass actually the blockage of the lower extremities in terms of peripheral arterial disease. But guess what? We found in Nebraska that is not, is not actually a problem of the vessel, but it's a problem of the muscle. This is a healthy muscle. This is a muscle of peripheral arterial disease patient. Look at this, okay? You certainly don't wanna have muscles who they look like that, but guess what? Peripheral arterial disease patients, because gets, they get very, very little blood over the years, that's what happens to their muscles actually too. So it's, it's not actually a plumbing problem, it's a machine problem with peripheral arterial disease, okay? So we actually look at this as well too, and we also found out that also they have serious problems in terms of variability, and they have serious problems in terms of variability before even their claudication pain, their pain, their ischemic pain actually starts, okay, all right? Um, we try to solve these problems actually by building different devices. This is an AFO that we have actually built it. And um, we, are also, we are also building actually exoskeletons who they are trying actually to provide help during walking, you know, to assist you in terms of walking actually uh, at, different, uh, at different levels, utilizing actually like a model that is based on optimal movement variability as well too. So anyway, so I guess I can talk to you about hours about the different things that I'm doing, uh, even the things that I'm doing like we, uh, uh, abroad actually with Dr. Hadzitaki over in Greece or different things. Uh, but I'm gonna stop about here with respect to different things. I wanna give you also however a little message <laughs> okay, that you can take home tonight, okay? When you will talk with your significant other or you will talk with a friend, or you will talk with your dog, or with your, with your cat. Um, you can tell them about the importance of variability, okay? Uh, variability, as I said, is very, very important. Incor try to incorporate it into your life, okay? All right, try to maintain your healthy variability patterns by doing some variable training if you can. If you lift weights, don't do the three sets of 10 that ACSM guidelines gives you, okay? Do actually few big lifts, many medium lifts and a huge number of small lifts, okay? Use that type of distribution, okay? And try to incorporate small variations in every aspect of your life. Personally, for example, I never go to work from the same route, okay? I take different routes just to go to work, okay? I, I, I leave from work from different routes, okay? Um, <laughs> I do like just little variations in everything. I never go to the same place for vacations, okay? Um, just, just little things as well too, just incorporated into your life actually too, okay? I honestly believe that this is actually uh, one of the ways that you can maintain your health, okay? With this, uh, I wanna leave you with a few pictures of my laboratory. This is my lab, okay? It's, it's actually a building. Um, I'm gonna brag a little bit about it, okay? So uh, we have one floor full of laboratories and we have one floor full of offices as well too. You're more than welcome to come and check it out. This is the different laboratories that we have, our virtual reality lab, 
our humongous gate lab as well too, uh, our 3D printing laboratory. I didn't tell you anything about all the work that we are doing with 3D printing and prosthesis. Um, we are actually expanding this actually. This is gonna be now 53,000 square feet and we're gonna add like uh, another t floor of laboratories and uh, about a half a floor of laboratories and a classroom even. Um, whoever wants to read more about those things actually too, maybe you got really, really excited about this nonlinear measures, we actually have a book out there that you can go and actually read. Um, you, uh, if you got like people that they're interested in, um, in any education, for example, in biomechanics, we also have like all kinds of degrees in that. If you're interested in finding out the hottest and latest in human movement variability, we actually have a meeting. It's the fourth annual human movement variability conference, actually, that we are running on May 16th, if you're interested in attending as well, too. Not that far away from here. Not that far away from here. I came yesterday. It's a lovely drive. It's a lovely drive, okay? All right? Um, not far away from here, okay? And this is actually, you know, my initial team with me, Jeremy, and Shane, it grew up into something like that, okay? All right, so thank you very much. We'll take a handful of questions. I'm going to go over here first. Really enjoyed your talk very much. I had a question for you regarding uh, the elderly in falls. Do you have those audio files available uh, for patients to be listening? Because you mentioned overground that works a whole lot better and, and having a variable. Uh, yeah, so, so actually I, <laughs> I created those for my mom, or Jane. <laughs> All right, so, but, um, I mean, experimentally we do, but, I mean, the, you know, the trial, the therapy has not underwent through the rigors of a clinical trial to be out there for the, for the masses, to be honest with you. So we do need that clinical trial to be able to do so. And I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry to say, I'm, I, I, I have keep trying to get money from the NIH to do that the last couple of years, and I'm getting close, but I have not been able to get the money to run the clinical trial. It's an interesting talk. My question is, have you looked at the variants in the same individual, like from the child, and in the young adult, and in the old one? The reason why I'm asking is, in the, uh, young, uh, in the infant, they have 213 bones because they are not joined together, so their variation will be more. And young adult, they are vigorous, so they can stand more. And in the older one, the gait is not all that right. So how did you, uh, have you studied the variation in the same individual over the period of years? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to ask with a funny, I'm going to give you a funny response to that. I will need a lifetime to do this, okay? <laughs> 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 all right, but, but that's my funny response. Anyway, you can actually, there is experimental ways to do that, of course. Um, but I will tell you this, uh, a lot of other people have done that. There is some really, really nice studies where they look variability across the lifespan, across the lifespan. Like for example, Carl Newell has done like some studies with respect to this. But what I can tell you is um, uh, variability in terms of the ways that I'm discussing it here, it depends upon a lot of different things. So for example, like most of the things that I presented to you were with posture, and then I presented to you what is happening with respect to uh, to gait as well to in elderly. So variability is task dependent, okay? So what I mean by that? So how pathology will affect variability many, many times? It, it will, will it go rigidity, it will, will go noisy? It will depend also upon the task as well too, okay? If, are you doing posture, are you doing dart throwing? What are you doing, okay? It will be task dependent. Uh, also, we have to differentiate between variability with respect to learning or de-learning, okay? or a natural variability as well too, okay, that just exists over there. So to answer, to give you, to give you an answer to your question is, there is a lot to be, to be found with respect to many of these things in terms of the explorations. Personally, I have looked both elderly, I have looked at both young, and I have looked at both even middle-aged adults or healthy young as well too, at a lot of different projects. Um, I, I cannot give you specific patterns with respect to this, but I will tell you just in general, 
uh, variability flow follows actually the patterns that we see in general in life. Okay? We become more complex, we have more beautiful patterns as we get older, when we are healthy, okay? and then as we age, for example, we lose some of these variants as well too, this, this complex that I was telling you about, and slowly, for example, those patterns deteriorate. Um, uh, question. So uh, I guess there's two. We're, we're clearly in the age of big data, and you've demonstrated that. And, and clinicians, we, we work in a world of small data. I mean, and we try to pull together inferences. And we've been told as we get data gets bigger and bigger, the ability to know what is r random versus, I mean, which is what you're saying, but what is significant in that, what's associated, what's causal, all those questions become extremely more complex. Based off of that, so it, it, one, do you agree with that? And what does that mean to the clinician in 20 years when we're trying to deal with all these issues of variability? Yeah. So, so first of all, like some, some take home messages with respect to that. First of all, don't trust just the mean and the standard deviation in the things that you're doing, okay, number one, okay? Uh, they could provide some information, but they give you partial information in terms of variability, okay? So if you got like this patient, for example, that is behaving, that he has an abnormal blood pressure, just to take a very simple example, if it gives you an abnormal blood pressure today, that doesn't mean that you just got, got to put him on statins tomorrow, okay? Follow that individual, okay? Get some data, get him like sphygmomanometer to measure himself like on a daily basis three or four times. Get an Excel file <laughs> with how the data look like over time as well too, before you will act as well too. So look at variations with respect to the other things. Cardiologists, for example, they use a device called the Holter device. I know because my brother is a cardiologist. And they look at actually how, uh, uh, how for example, heart rate changes over days, okay? So they look at, for example, some of these things. So I will say that's number one. Uh, number two, to address exactly this point, because I'm also aware of that point and the importance of that point, to address that, we've been trying to create like smart technologies, okay? We're trying to make your life easier. So for example, like things that will actually will be easy for you to help the patient with. That's, that's why we develop like, for example, these glasses, this, uh, this metronomes and stuff like that. I mean, I don't anticipate that actually the clinician will have to measure all these things and build those metronomes and stuff like that. I anticipate that actually this auditory files that you that I was asked earlier will be available for you on your phone okay so imagine for example an app an app that will actually will walk slowly will measure your gait and then will take your favorite music <laughs> will manipulate it in a fashion that you will walk on it so all you need is just your phone okay uh, how close we are in this app very close maybe i'm revealing too much too <laughs> okay, Nick, we certainly appreciate you coming, and let's once again, let's uh, 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 show our uh, appreciation for you coming to no Kirksville. Uh, so we need to uh, progress on uh, to lunch. We're going to be having lunch in the same place where we had our breakfast in, in the Centennial Commons area. During lunch, there, will, there are two options. Uh, starting at 1 o'clock, we'll be having a poster session. Uh, and uh, part of poster sessions is the ability to, to have formal presentations with judges. And so during lunch, we'll be establishing uh, judges, judging teams. And we particularly, uh, and anyone has the potential of doing, being participating in that. We will have some training during lunch, and that will be held when you walk into the commons on the right-hand side of the room. If you're interested in doing that, you can go there. We'll give you some training. We have some, some uh, 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 um, experienced judges that are going to be leading the teams, and then you'll be able to actually participate with that. If you're not interested in that, the, the, the other side of the room will be for just open lunch time, and then we'll be all ready at 1 o'clock to go upstairs to the lab for the poster session. So thank you very much for your attention this morning. Uh, we'll see you over in the comments for lunch.